Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Astha Grover, um, and I'm a contributor to the Zephyr project um, since 2019, and I work for Intel Corporation. Um, I've been contributing uh, lately towards uh, the logging subsystem, uh, especially towards the uh, logging formats implementation. Um, in past, I've also uh, contributed towards uh, Twister test suite and other areas. Um, if you have any questions after the presentation, um, I can be reached on uh, Discord. And uh, you can also find me on GitHub uh, by my handle AsthaGR, which you can see here. Um, here is the agenda uh, uh, listed for my presentation today. I will be uh, giving an overview of the logging subsystem and how to start uh, using the logging APIs uh, for most uh, basic use cases. And uh, following that, um, I will be talking about the architecture of uh, the logging subsystem, uh, the log process, and the workflow. And uh, then I will briefly show uh, the log APIs that are available for uh, users and developers um, and the different modes of logging, um, how each one of them can be used and the advantages of one over the other. I'll cover all of that today. So um, and then we'll see uh, the extension of uh, logging to the multi-domain um, and also how memory allocation uh, works for the messages. Um, finally, um, I will show the logging formats uh, supported in Zephyr um, and talk about their pros and cons and uh, how we can switch the logging formats at runtime, uh, which is a feature provided by the subsystem itself uh, and supported in Zephyr. Um, and I will cover an, any basic style as we go. So um, after the presentation, feel free to ask any questions on Discord channel um, if you need to. Um, So when we talk of logging, why was logging needed in the first place? Any ideas? Um, yeah, its purpose is multifold. Um, it can be used for uh, debugging purposes, for uh, even for tracing, or can even just be used to um, output any informatory logs. Um, logs from Zephyr are usually uh, human readable strings and they give uh, printf-like results. And uh, logging subsystem can also do the string formatting uh, using the support for uh, CB printf functionality um, uh, in Zephyr. And it also supports all the format specifiers. Um, but how, how is logging different from the uh, simple print case? Um, it, it provides you with uh, some more features than a simple print case uh, would uh, provide. Uh, which would include any source identification, uh, like where the logs are coming from, um, the severity levels, and also time of log generation, uh, that is uh, time stamping. And we can log from any context in Zephyr, uh, which is also a feature of its uh, uh, of the logging subsystem. Uh, but to log from any context, uh, it would mean that we can log not just from threads, uh, but even from the uh, interrupt context, even the high priority uh, interrupts. Um, so, yeah. And uh, we can also dump the hex dump data uh, using another uh, other log APIs like log hex dump. And uh, we'll go over the log APIs uh, supported in Zephyr in the upcoming slides. Um, when we log, uh, we, we want to capture the informatory logs, the debugging logs, or the error logs even. Uh, but it depends uh, what the source or application needs. And there can be different log levels for different parts of the system. Uh, but some of the severity levels supported in Zephyr are um, uh, information, uh, warning, uh, debug, and error modes. And each level uh, is defined as a macro in Zephyr. Um, Finally, um, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. Finally, it's important to note that how do we output the logs? Uh, how do we see them? We can see them either on the uh, UART serial console or can also store them in the file system um, and send them over to the uh, Bluetooth or Net subsystems. Um, we can also process the logs via uh, logging backends, um, depending upon what backends are enabled and supported.
Now getting to the basics, uh, let's start with how to log using Zephyr in the first place. Uh, to enable logging in a Zephyr application, uh, you literally just need these three things. Uh, you enable the logging using the kconfig option uh, config underscore log in the PRJ conf of the application, which is the configuration file for the application. Um, in, and uh, make sure to include the logging header uh, log.h in the source file, uh, which will enable you to use uh, logger APIs uh, provided by logging subsystem. Just uh, register the log module uh, after including the log.h header. Uh, just register the log module using the unique name um, and use the API like log um, and use the APIs like log uh, INF or log error uh, following that. Um, on the left side, you can see the snapshot of uh, Zephyr Hello World application um, and its output when uh, when used uh, the log API inside that. Uh, like we have used log INF hello please uh, in this application. Uh, the output here has, uh, has few elements though. Uh, the first one is that it contains the timestamp of generation, the log generation, uh, then the severity level, um, the module name, and then the log message. So that's about the basics. Uh, we use uh, log INF here, uh, but there are other APIs that the uh, that the logging subsystem provides us. Uh, let's glance um, at few of them here. Uh, here X specifies the severity level uh, type, which could be error, information, uh, debug, or warning. Um, we have normal uh, log APIs like um, uh, like log underscore x, uh, and then we also have log um, inst underscore x, which captures the logs uh, associated with the particular instance of the module. Um, and there is also an API uh, to dump the hex, hex dump data, like log hex dump underscore x. Um, and the important ones I think to uh, note here are that you need to register the module before you can log uh, from that module and uh, you do that by using the log module register API and um, in case there are multiple files in the module uh, you just need to register it uh, once but uh, make sure to declare the module in every source file uh, which wants to use the logging um, and module can be declared using log module declare API as we have specified here um, uh, plus, there they, we have some more um, um, some more logging APIs like log print key and log uh, raw APIs, uh, which lets you print the uh, the raw log messages. And um, X here uh, just specifies the severity level type, uh, which could be error information, debug, or warning again. Um, so. Uh, let's see this now. Uh, but how does this all happen? And uh, it, it might be interesting uh, to know for everybody how the logging process uh, flow looks like and the important components of the subsystem itself. Um, uh, the subsystem has a core uh, which, which holds the core functionality, a front end and a back end. Um, and depending upon uh, what architecture or what parts of the system we are dealing with, uh, there might be different backends enabled and there can be more than one backends um, active at single point of time. There, there are multiple backends, up to nine uh, backends that are supported in Zephyr. Um, and the core is uh, where we have the base of the logging subsystem, um, which decides if the control flow lands up using a front end um, and back end or just the front end or uh, disables the front end altogether. There are uh, kconfig options like um, um, config front log front end only, uh, which says, which indicates that we can just have uh, a front end enabled um, and not the back ends or anything else. So, and uh, the front ends are engaged by default uh, when you use the log API or call them in your application. Um, they are uh, responsible for. Um, log filtering uh, which can be build time or um, or runtime um, it's also responsible for allocating the buffer um, and also to create and commit the messages um, 
So that's for the uh, front ends. And uh, front ends are also optimized uh, to log messages faster. Uh, like, like if we are, uh, like if we are logging, for example, uh, logging from an interrupt context. We don't want to spend too much time in the interrupt and do not block the other parts of the system. So it's optimized for that. Uh, so that, that was about the architecture of the logging subsystem on the high level. So now we have seen already that uh, the logging process contains the following. Uh, we need to filter the log messages uh, depending upon what logs we are looking for. Um, and we need to allocate the buffer to the message um, and uh, finally create the message and commit the message, uh, commit and output the message basically. Um, a log message is uh, something which can be defined as a self-contained uh, continuous block of memory um, in the context of memory. Um, and it is mostly suited for copying the message too. Um, because there are some parts where we need the we need to copy the message too, um, and uh, log message is usually self-contained. Um, uh, we don't want the memory to be um, uh, sparse, so we try to allocate a continuous block to a log message. Uh, it contains a message descriptor, uh, which identifies the message and uh, usually comprises of a uh, source ID, domain, um, and also severity level. Uh, and it, it also contains a uh, timestamp, uh, the formatted string details if we have passed a string, and also the optional data. At a, uh, just, just glance here um, at how the message format uh, looks like. Uh, note that there are uh, two bits allocated to the buffer uh, for log message, uh, and I'll talk more about that in detail in the following slides. Uh, there is also a flag for log message, which is uh, just one bit, and then there are uh, domain ID and uh, severity level, each of them allocated to three bits. Um, there is a cvprintf package length, uh, which can take up to 10 bits. Um, the data length um, is uh, can be up to 12 bits, and there is a pointer to the source descriptor as well. Um, and also the timestamp, which can be 32 or 64 bits, depending upon um, what system uh, is being used. And there can be optional padding if required. Um, and apart from that, uh, there is a CB printf package, um, hex dump data, uh, and alignment padding, um, which can be there in the message itself. And these are uh, the last three ones are the optional members. Now um, we, we manage the uh, messages and allocate some memory for each of the member item. Uh, we use a circular buffer uh, to allocate the continuous block of uh, memory for the log messages. Uh, and this circular buffer, uh, buffer is also referred to as a multi-producer single consumer uh, packet buffer, uh, which is also known as MPSC PBUF. And uh, when this uh, buffer gets full, uh, the messages also need to be sequentially freed. Um, and as we see, we, we sometimes need to make a copy of the messages. Uh, so uh, the backend processing of these log messages is synchronous. Um, so we can make a copy if we are selecting a type of mode uh, that we'll talk about uh, in the following slides, which is deferred processing. So uh, this circular buffer is also uh, known as MPSC PBUF uh, in other uh, in short, and it operates in the FIFO order, which means uh, first in, first out order. And the allocation policy says uh, that if buffer is full or the requested uh, space cannot be allocated, uh, then there are uh, two options that we have here. First is that uh, we have the overwrite enabled via uh, config log mode overflow uh, kconfig option, and then the oldest packets uh, in which the oldest packets are dropped and until the requested space is allocated. And uh, this option uh, generally degrades the performance because we are dropping the old packets. And there is the second option, no overwrite, uh, 
um, in this option, uh, read and write index pairs um, are used to see if there is any available space. Uh, if space cannot be allocated and overwrite is disabled, uh, then uh, we return a null pointer um, or the context blocks if the allocation was uh, with a timeout. Um, and in context of the memory, uh, the packet is produced um, and then it is consumed. Um, uh, producing has uh, two steps to it. Um, the requested amount of data um, is allocated and uh, then the producer fills the data. And uh, finally, we, when we produce the packet, we would consume it. Consuming the packet also has two steps. Um, it would, the consumer would claim the packet, which means they would get the pointer uh, to, the, to the packet itself and the length of the packet. Um, and then the packet would be freed up. Uh, this approach, uh, consuming the packet um, and freeing the packet and required uh, would reduce the memory copying. So it's good. Now uh, let's go over uh, the header bits. Um, how the header bits are uh, structured in the uh, memory buffer. Um, as we um, saw there that there are two bits assigned to the header, uh, which is associated with um, each packet in the buffer. One bit um, is for the valid bit, uh, which is uh, set to one uh, when packet is, um, when packet would contain the uh, a valid packet. The other bit is for the busy bit. Uh, which would be set to one when the uh, packet is being consumed um, and is not free for use. So, uh, so this bit uh, would signify that the packet is claimed uh, but not free. Um, and here you can see the table internally to uh, evaluate um, if the uh, packet is valid, uh, claimed or free. So when both bits are set to zero, we say that the space is free for use um when uh, when the valid bit is set uh, is set to 1 but the busy bit is 0 uh, then we would say that it it, it is a valid packet uh, but when both are 1 um, it would mean that it's a claimed valid packet it's it's valid plus busy so claimed valid packet and uh, when only busy, busy bit is set uh, it means that um, it's a skip packet uh, which um, which is used to indicate the padding um, at the end of the buffer and uh, you know padding is required for multiple reasons while allocating the memory to the buffer from the buffer now uh, we can have uh, so many logs um, and uh, we need some way to identify them or uh, filter them uh, based on the uh, source or module um, and also based on what we need uh, it will not only help uh, to to not overload the system, but um, also to reduce the image size. Um, and there are two types of filtering that we can have. Um, uh, one of them is the compile time filtering, uh, which we use when the logs are being built. Uh, and the compile time filtering can be um, on the basis of uh, module or even severity levels. Uh, the other one is uh, runtime filtering, uh, which filters on the basis of uh, source. Um, and the source can be a module or even a specific instance of the module. Um, and uh, runtime filtering uh, is independent for um, each backend. Um, that means that every backend can have their own filters uh, set. So. Um, Remember uh, that we have like more than uh, one backend active um, at a time and uh, we can also have uh, filters for each of them uh, which are completely independent of each other. Now um, I'll go over a little bit about um, the uh, details to the runtime filtering. Uh, we can have the filter structure uh, uh, so we, we have the filter structure, which is uh, declared in RAM uh, for every source of logging that we have. Um, and this filter structure has uh, 10 three-bit slots that are declared in RAM. Um, each slot contains the, or, or stores the uh, current filter for the uh, backend in the system. 
and um, in Zephyr we can have um, nine backends supported. So we have ten slots, uh, nine for backends, and uh, one slot, uh, the slot zero, um, which has bits zero to two, uh, is used to uh, is used to aggregate the uh, maximal filter setting for given logging source. An aggregate uh, slot would uh, determine if the log message is created uh, for given entry uh, because it indicates that uh, there is at least one backend uh, that is expecting that log entry. So start zero is kind of a global setting, like minimal of all. Um, and backend slots would be examined when the messages um, message is processed by the core uh, to see if the backend accepts the message or not. So, um, and in runtime filtering, uh, the binary footprint is increased uh, though because uh, the logs get compiled in. So it, it, it just increases the footprint in that case. Now we have seen uh, how memory gets allocated and uh, why is it important to uh, filter the logs uh, which can impact the performance uh, based on what kconfig options are enabled and uh, some other factors. Um, the logging subsystem um, also has uh, or provides us with an option uh, for logging where we can, um, where, where there can be a trade-off between the system performance uh, and the amount of uh, memory or footprint that is occupied. Um, so here we go for the three modes of logging uh, that Zephyr supports. Um, there is the deferred mode, uh, the immediate mode, and the minimal mode. For deferred mode, uh, the, the log messages are uh, buffered and uh, processed later uh, in the known context. And for deferred mode uh, is definitely a time consuming process uh, because it gives us a rich formatting and also precise uh, time stamping. Plus, um, it also gives us both uh, build time and compile time filtering options and um, can be used for any backend. Um, and this deferred mode is definitely synchronous and also close to being non-intrusive. We're non-intrusive um, as if the as if this mode or the logging never existed. So it's it, it's it doesn't interfere with other parts of the system. And for the immediate mode, uh, the output is immediate um, and follows the process flow of the application. Um, you know, the, the immediate mode would definitely impact the performance though uh, when uh, time consuming operations are performed uh, from the high priority context or the high priority interrupts. Um, and it has its own disadvantages, uh, but it's still uh, useful while debugging. Um, Immediate mode uh, has only uh, support for limited backends, but um, that's the con for the um, immediate mode. Uh, the minimal mode, however, uh, consumes very less memory and has uh, the lowest footprint, uh, but it doesn't have any light, nice look uh, giving features like color uh, formatting or time stamping uh, or any filtering options. Uh, it redirects the uh, logs to the print key, uh, so it just has uh, similar results with some benefits of logging though. So um, we have talked about a lot of, for, about the logging subsystem, but um, uh, which has its own challenges. And uh, when it comes to logging from uh, multiple sources, uh, there is one of the challenge it has, uh, which is for the multi-domain logging. Um, when we log, uh, we can have any number of sources, uh, but apart from them, um, even from a single core, uh, there can be multiple domains. Uh, for example, a core can also have multiple domains. Um, like if you have seen the ARM Trust Core Zone, uh, it has two domains secure and non-secure. Uh, but what exactly is the domain? Um, I'll, I'll establish the definition here for clarity um, that domain is something uh, which has its independent uh, binary build uh, or the uh, binary image. 
uh, but to note here uh, we cannot access memory of other domain so uh, the memory access is restricted across cross domains we cannot uh, access cross domain memory um, and there are uh, uh, there are these approaches to multi domain logging that we could opt for um, the first one is um, described very simply but it's much more complicated um, that you can log inside every domain independently uh, but this approach is not scalable um, as the system would be uh, would be overloaded with the logs the um, other approach uh, is to use the uh, multi domain uh, logging interface uh, that the logging subsystem provides um, using this approach the uh, log messages uh, inside each domain uh, goes to one root domain um, the messages are passed from uh, one domain to another using um, a, a log link interface, uh, a link between the domains uh, where one link uh, backend can transfer messages to the another link backend. Um, and uh, the log link interface uh, receives log messages uh, from other domains. Um, it creates a copy. Uh, and put a local log message copy uh, into a message queue. Um, and the log link interface implementation is very similar to the, um, the complementary backend implementation. So it looks uh, similar, uh, but has a different function to, to transfer the uh, messages between cross domains. Um, when we talk of domains, um, we have uh, different types of domains uh, when we talk of uh, multi-domain logging. Uh, there is the uh, end domain, a relay domain, and, um, and the root domain. The root domain has uh, one or more links and, um, and also has the backend that can output the logs to the user. Um, there is the relay domain, uh, which has links to other domains but does not have any backends for output. Um, it just has a cross domain backend um, either to another relay or to the root domain. The, um, the end domain um, is the one uh, which has a logging core implementation um, and also a cross domain backend. Uh, and in this picture, uh, we have two cores um, and each core has two domains, secure and non-secure. And uh, this is how the communication looks like uh, between the end domain, relay domain, and uh, root domain. And for more information uh, on that, I, I encourage you to go through the documentation too. Um, now, um, I'll talk about the most important aspect of uh, logging from user's perspective, um, which is the type of logging formats which are uh, supported in Zephyr. Um, there is this MIPI SISTI uh, logging format, uh, and uh, it's basically a universal data format and is supported by many, many, many systems. Um, and uh, it's used for sharing the uh, debug and trace information between the, uh, the test systems and the devices uh, like SOCs or platforms. Um, and, um, Using this format, it simplifies the integration of the embedded uh, software with the with any debug hardware or DUTs, etc. Um, it's used for uh, developing the uh, test products. It's kind of uh, hex uh, data, but each part has its own specification. Uh, so each part signifies something, uh, and you can look up more information about uh, about the MIPI SISTI in the in the repository in Zephyr project, which is maintained by the project itself. Um, yeah. And uh, then there is uh, the normal text format, uh, which is uh, the one which is def enabled by default. If you if you do not enable any format, then you would just uh, you would just uh, enable the text format. Uh, MIPI SISTI, however, can be enabled using the kconfig option, uh, config log MIPI SISTI enable, uh, which will provide you all the support, um, plus would include the MIPI SISTI library. Um, and 
there is also a dictionary uh, log format uh, which is quite compact and uh, can be enabled using the log dictionary uh, con config log dictionary support option um, and this outputs data in the binary format uh, and um, encodes the arguments to formatted strings um, in their native storage formats um, and uh, we have also support for um, uh, custom uh, logging formats um, and support for which is provided using the uh, config log custom format support option. Uh, so any custom log format can be easily added to Zephyr um, because the, the interface is such to be able to uh, accommodate for any custom format. And um, I personally have uh, implemented the MIPI CC support in Zephyr. Uh, so feel free to uh, drop in any questions um, uh, for that if you have any uh, on Discord or if you're planning to use uh, that format. Um, I've also added support for uh, dynamic switching of uh, logging formats at runtime. Uh, basically, um, a user can pass the uh, output format uh, needed to the supported APIs, uh, like they can use log format set, uh, which sets the uh, log format that is passed by the user um, for the backend that they have uh, passed into the API. And or, or else they can use uh, log format set all active backends a, uh, API. Uh, which would take the uh, log type that user wants to set for all the um, current active backends. Um, there are limitations to, uh, to use this uh, feature specifically in the uh, deferred logging mode. Um, it, it would result in the uh, number of drop messages uh, when there are large number of messages uh, that needs to be printed. Um, and due to that, uh, you won't see complete results um, if you turn on this feature uh, in the deferred mode. So I highly recommend uh, to use this uh, in immediate mode only. And here is uh, an example of how the uh, dynamic switching of logging format uh, would look like at runtime. Uh, this is an example uh, from one of the uh, Zephyr sample uh, application for uh, switching of logging formats. Um, the first block shows uh, here the uh, MIPI SISTI um, uh, format output. And um, then we switch to the text. And then again, we switch back to the uh, MIPI SISTI logs. Um, I find this uh, feature really cool. Um, so yeah, try it out and let me know if you have any questions here. Um, that's all I had for today. Um, and here are some uh, of the references uh, that you could uh, find helpful. Um, I encourage all the viewers to uh, look at the uh, Zephyr documentation for logging subsystem uh, and also the contribution guide. Uh, the links of uh, both are embedded in the uh, presentation. So you'd find it on my slides. Um, and there are uh, the mailing list for users and developers uh, uh, where you can post your uh, questions um, and also there is a Discord channel for uh, logging and tracing. Uh, please use that to uh, post any questions and inputs. That's all. Any questions, comments for me? I'm available to answer on Discord. Thank you very much for uh, watching this presentation and my talk today.